In the garage of Dr. Frank Conrad, on November 2nd, 1920, the first scheduled pre-advertised radio program in the United States went on the air. Station KDKA was broadcasting returns of the presidential race on the evening of Election Day. From a humble beginning in a Pittsburgh garage to the sumptuous studios of the National Radio Networks in New York, Chicago, and Hollywood, these are the years we refer to as the golden age of radio. Here's the Manhattan merry-go-round that brings you the bright side of life, that whirls you in music to all the big night spots of New York town. To hear the top songs of the week sung so clearly you can understand every word and sing it yourself. Al Kemp, on the air for Griffin. It's time to shine, shine your shoes and Tony Home Permanent presents... This is Nora Drake. Tonight, Barrett Mutual Savings Bank presents the fourth program in a series that will explore this golden era. Barrett Mutual Savings Bank, with offices at Corbin's Corner, West Hartford, 267 Main Street, New Britain, and Slater Road, New Britain. Barrett where you'll benefit from 81 years of banking experience. This is Dick Bertell, and the co-host of the Golden Age of Radio is the man with 2,000 hours of radio memories on tape, Mr. Ed Corcoran. And Ed, I would say we have a blockbuster tonight. We sure do, Dick. We have uh, two, uh, two of the very famous, most famous people in, uh, in radio, I would say, with us this evening. And I think... Uh, one of the funniest, really, and I'm talking about Peg Lynch, who delighted radio audiences for years with the couple next door, better known as Ethel and Albert. It's good to see you again, Peg. Thank you. Now, Ethel and Albert came to the attention of the national radio audience in 1944, Peg, but mm -hmm. uh, Ethel and Albert had their start a number of years back in a number of small radio stations yes, around the country where you uh, were working. You were a woman's radio host. Well, I had a woman's program, yes. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. and, and how did Ethel and Albert work itself into a, a, a woman's program? I had been hired to write copy at this uh, first radio station in uh, Albert Lee, Minnesota, K-A-T-E. And uh, when I got there in a blizzard, it was a January night, and the temperature was about 30 below, and I was terrified. And when I walked into the station... It was a Sunday night. I'd arrived, and I walked in the station on Monday morning. The girl said to me, well, do, you, do you have your uh, show written for the next day? And I said, no, what show? <laughs> I was just hired to write commercial copy. And uh, so she said, no, you're taking somebody's place, and you have to write. You have to uh, perform. And it would be a woman's show uh, six days a week from 10 to 10.30. And I stayed up all night. I didn't know how to type then. I've since taught myself. But then the first day I went on, I thought, well, I better lower my voice. Yeah. And I was so breathless, and I said, Good morning, everyone. Uh, did we bring you today this woman's show? And it so bored me that the third day I decided to write a little sketch, a little husband and wife thing, and that's uh, how Ethel and Albert started. At first, it was it was only about three minutes, and uh, I uh, it was kind of dumb. Ethel was kind of stupid. She did. I think I really, to be honest with you, I think I got it from Easy Aces. Mm -hmm, I'd always mm -hmm. liked listening to them, and I thought Jane was pretty funny. And I did stupid things. Ethel did stupid things that she'd uh, buy a grand piano because it was on sale when they already had a piano. You know, mm -hmm. dumb things like that. And I was only there about four months. Uh, I just worked all the time. I, in addition to writing the Half Hour Women's Show on 250 spots a week, I wrote a Half Hour Play on Sunday. Sometimes I was running in. I was running out to type up the last end while the others were doing part of it, though I was in it, too. And a 15-minute play on Sunday and two 10-minute plays on Tuesday and Thursday and a five-minute one and I, on Wednesday. And for that, I was paid uh, $70 a month. Marvelous. <laughs> 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 of course, one of the, uh, the people who appeared with you uh, regularly on the show was uh, a great motion picture actress, Margaret Hamilton. That's right. And uh, what part did she play? She was Aunt Eva ah. on our television show. And then she became Aunt Effie when we did the, went back to radio. But so many more of our listeners tonight, Peg, would remember Margaret Hamilton's voice as the Wicked Witch of the West in that delightful children's motion picture classic, The Wizard of Oz. You remember? I 
thought you said she was dead. That was her sister, the Wicked Witch of the East. This is the Wicked Witch of the West. She's worse than the other one was. Who killed my sister? Who killed the Witch of the East? Was it you? No. No, it was an accident. I didn't mean to kill anybody. Well, my little pretty, I can cause accidents too. Oh, <laughs> rubbish. You have no power here. Be gone before somebody drops the house on you. Too. Very well. I'll bide my time. But just try to stay out of my way. Just try. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog too. <laughs> Oh, did I dislike you. Our, our second guest tonight is Margaret Hamilton. And Maggie, it is a pleasure to welcome you to this program as well. Well, thank you. I'm very glad to be here. <laughs> Now prove you don't talk like that. Yes. <laughs> I prove I can talk this way too. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a delightful film, and and so you have audiences today of of all ages, don't you? That's right. Fans mm -hmm. who are five and six, and who go on to. Uh, We're afraid. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, the picture is designed to uh, appeal to uh, to everyone. Yes, it was. Well, tell me uh, just a bit about uh, your association with Ethel and Albert. Well, it was one of the nicest things, I think, about the nicest thing I ever did. I just loved every minute of it, and the curse peg was so wonderful, and Alan was so perfect with it, and it was such a marvelously fun thing. The, the feeling among us, I think, was so great. We were all, all were very fond of each other and worked wonderfully together, and it really was absolutely delightful. I loved every minute of it. I loved the character she gave me to do Aunt Eva, who was a martyr, you know, mm -hmm. the kind that when you go out and have a good time, and I'll stay home and do the dishes. <laughs> no, no, Aunt Eva, we want you to come. It's, no, no, now you go on. I'll just, I'll just stay here by myself. And and she, it, it was great fun. And then and the, on the radio shows, and we were talking about it a little bit ago, and saying that, that uh, I've never had this experience before, nor have I heard it very often, uh, where the, the wonderful business of interrupting each other or commenting as someone else is saying something to you. Albert, I remember would be saying, now, Annie, mm -hmm. why don't you do so? And she said, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, yes, uh-huh, mm -hmm, yeah, all right. Uh -huh. Well, I, uh, mm, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, well, I don't, I, mm, mm, you know, how you keep interrupting each other. Well, we're going to interrupt right here for a word from Burrett Mutual Savings Bank, and then we'll be right back. Please take the stand, ma'am. Raise your right hand. Do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Do you have a savings account at Burrett Mutual Savings Bank? I do. Do you have it there for their high dividends, compounded monthly, figured from day of deposit to day of withdrawal? No. In order to take advantage of Burrett's 6% certificates or the popular 5 and 3 quarter percent one-year certificates? No. Well, do you have it at Burrett for their three handy offices, two in New Britain and one in West Hartford? No. You patronize Burrett because of their new modern buildings, their friendly tellers and fast, efficient service? No. Well, tell the court, ma'am, in your own words, why you consistently do business at Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. Because they are mutual. What, you all? Mutual. They work for us. Their profits go to us in dividends and reserves. As depositors, we own them. For me, for you, for the judge, everybody. <coughs> there will be a slight recess in this court while I start my account at Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. Well, Peg, uh, let's get back to uh, the early days. Uh, I read, I guess, in one of your uh, articles about you in mm -hmm. one of the magazines that when you uh, wrote Ethel and Albert originally, uh, you had no intention of playing the role. You wanted to find someone else to play it. You wanted to do the writing. And could you tell us, you know, what led you to the fact that you did not play the role? What was some of the circumstances? Well, I played the role uh, on the, I uh, worked at a couple other small radio stations before I came to New York. And, uh, of course, I always played Ethel. You know, I wrote it and I played it. And uh, when I came to New York, uh, I was uh, too scared, really. T I didn't want to put myself in competition with the, all the actors that I'd been listening to, you know, in the, out in the hinterlands there in Minnesota. And uh, I thought, well, gee, I just can't compete with them, and I didn't want to be insulted by being told, bluntly, that I wasn't any good. So I told them I just flatly refused to do it. I would write it, but I, I wouldn't be in it. And so uh, they, uh, we auditioned, and uh, all the actresses and actors that were on the soap operas came for the audition. And uh, I well remember the script that it was all, that we did. That was the first one. And Ethel and Albert were entertaining at dinner that night. And uh, one of the lines was uh, a couple of lines. Ethel said to Albert, uh, uh, "Did you bring home a salted nuts?" And what salted nuts? 
Why didn't you bring home a salted nuts? It was the last thing I said to you this morning, bring home a salted nuts. Well, the actors and actors that auditioned for it, and I was sitting in the control room listening to them, listening to these models, you know, of, of big time, and uh, they, would all without exception, would say, and they're all good actors, too, but mm-hmm. they were so accustomed to playing soap opera. And they would say, the girl would say, did you bring home the salted nuts? What salted nuts? <laughs> Last thing I said to you this morning was bring home the salted nuts. And then Rosario would come in with yeah, a stick. Well, she did used to play for me, by the way. You know, Rosa? She played here when we were. Yes, no. she's darling. She used to do the organ on our show later on. And uh, I was terribly distressed by it because my dialogue wasn't written that way. And also, the average soap opera script ran about six or seven pages, I think. Some, mine ran ten. Mm-hmm. So obviously, mm-hmm. they had to speak faster. And I'd say to the uh, uh, director, I said, couldn't you go out and tell them to just, you know, speed it up? If anything, try to talk like, like people do. And uh, uh, he decided that because, as I said, I was very clever in doing it, though unwittingly so, by absolutely adamantly refusing to play the part, they were determined to have me. <laughs> And uh, so they they took the records of all the uh, uh, you know the, all the auditions and gave everybody a number. Mm-hmm. And so then they they called me in and told me that number thirty one and number eleven had won and I was number thirty one. So. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we listen now to an excerpt of Ethel and Albert? <laughs> Considering the fact that I, well, I didn't know you knew any men at all in Rome, Italy. Naturally, I merely asked a simple question and you fly off the handle. Mm. Nice to know your husband doesn't trust you, too. Oh, look, I am sorry. I really am. Maybe it's my fault. I, I do trust you, honey. You know that. But you'll have to admit that you have acted strangely the last few days. Now, Aunt Effie, hasn't she... Well, I, I'm trying to stay out of this. But I am going to say that whatever she's acted strange about has nothing to do with any, well, secret romance. Oh, of course. Now, 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 now look, sweetheart, whatever it is. Well, I'll also say this. It's something she thought you'd be mad at. And Effie? In fact, she said, I can't tell him. He'll kill me. <laughs> now, isn't that terrible? Yes. Oh, I'll, I'll get it. I'll get it. I, I read. Now, I, I think that is just terrible. I'm ashamed of you to feel that way about your own husband. There now, dear. When he gets off the phone, you tell him you lost your passport. Yes, that's right. My name is Piper. Yes. Who did you say is calling? Who is it, dear? Is it Mr. Whittaker? Yes. Alvin said he'd call early this morning. No. Is it Mr. Whittaker? Uh, no, no, no. I, I, I didn't get the name, but apparently oh. somebody from the American Embassy. Oh. Hello. Yes. Yes. Dear, dear, it's, it's, it's probably for me. Dear, I want to ask them not to call here. I know. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm sure there's some mistake. No, no, no. My wife has not lost her passport. <laughs> no, no. must be some of... What? I see. Could you hold on a minute, sir? Aunt Effie, I think you better stand between us. Oh, it's only six o'clock. Boy, everybody else on the plane seems to be sleeping all right. <laughs> look, look at Aunt Effie. She yes. who wouldn't be able to close her eyes all night. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> she and Betsy have been dead to the world since we got back on it, Shannon. So were you and everyone else. I thought somebody better stay awake and keep an eye on the motors. Oh, <laughs> you've been watching them all night? Oh, yes, like an anxious mother. I've kept an eye on the motors and the stewardess. When she's sitting back there sort of dozing, I feel all right. What I don't like is when she suddenly springs to life and streaks up the aisle to the pilot's compartment. I want to know why. Oh, honey, <laughs> stop worrying. Oh, well, I imagine a dozen things, like the pilot has just buzzed her and said... Don't tell anyone, but our tail end has just dropped off. <laughs> oh, God, you and your imagination. <laughs> I'll be glad we land in New York, I tell you that. Only two uh, more hours. Yeah, two more hours? Yeah. Oh, no, no, darling. We're supposed to get in at Idlewild Airport at 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock? New yeah. York time, honey. Huh? Our watches are still on Rome time. I mean, there's five oh. hours difference, isn't there? Sure, we got another seven hours. Seven hours? Now, look, you oh, try and dear. get some sleep, and I'll keep an eye on the motors. And the stewardess. <laughs> You. Your smallpox vaccination reports. I trust you haven't lost those. No, dear, we have well, them. Now make sure, will you? Because this is where we need them. We can't get back into the country without I, them. I know, I know. Honestly, we've hung on to them all through mm-hmm. Europe. Don't go on about it. 
Here they are. Here they are. mine. His passport. And, and here are mine. Uh, indeed, yeah. Here they after are. After all the trouble we had in Rome, after you lost your passport, you can hardly Quiet. blame me for wanting to make sure. Golly, every time I think about that. After all I said please, to you... Please, dear, you... please, dear. You always act as though I'm the only person who loses no, things. No, but I... Yeah. And anyhow, I found my passport again. You mean I found it. Yes, no. you <laughs> found it. I'm sorry. All right, now, look, let's get organized. No. Get your hats on. Get the cameras off the rack. And for once, let's not leave anything on the plane. <laughs> Well, there's the baggage being brought in over there, dear. People seem to be getting their own and then taking it over to the counters where the customs men are. I know, I know. We have that. to get in this line over here first, probably oh, yeah. the health inspector. Oh, I see. <laughs> well, if that's the health inspectors, I am certainly going to ask them what they meant. Keeping us sitting on the plane after we got here, and then that man <clears throat> getting on and fumigating us with that spray gun or whatever he was doing. Goodness, I'm still caught. Well, now, 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 don't start something. It's a regulation, I suppose. Oh. Some kind of precaution. Well, I'm inclined to agree with Aunt Effie. Mm -hmm. What kind of an impression must it give people who are coming to the States for the first time? They arrive here and get fumigated before they even get off the plane. There's <laughs> always a good reason for everything. Now, come on, please don't mention it, will you? I want to get through the customs, you know, and over to my office so sure. I can wind up my business mm -hmm. in New York and mm -hmm. we can fly on home tomorrow. Yeah, dear, right? we're you know, right up there. Huh? Uh, passport oh. and oh. certificate of vaccination, please. Yeah. Oh, all right, sir. Yeah. All right here. <laughs> you all together? Oh, yes, sir, yes. It's my wife and my Hello. aunt and my daughter. <laughs> How long have you been abroad? Uh, three and a half months. Oh, hello there. Hi. Did you have a good time? Oh, yes. Wonderful. Ah, that's good. Well, now, your wife, your aunt, and your daughter are all in order, but I don't seem to have any certificate of vaccination for you, sir. What? There's none here. It was right with my passport. I don't see any. I just had it. What's the matter? He doesn't seem to have a certificate of I vaccination. Just had it on the plane, didn't I? Didn't I? Didn't I just... I just... Well, I don't know. What, what do you mean you well, don't know? I well, just... You said you had it. I didn't actually see it, but dear. Please, I was getting all our passports and our certificates of vaccination together. Yes, and yes, I had yes, it. I know that. I know that. And we, we gave you ours, darling. Well, look, but I didn't see yours. I had it. I tell you, I know well, I had it. Maybe you dropped it coming in from the plane. I couldn't hmm? have dropped it. I had it with my passport well, and a rubber band around. There, 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 there. There's the rubber band. I can see the rubber band. But that won't do you much good. I'm afraid you'll have to have the certificate. <laughs> I'll have to ask you to step out of line. Perhaps if you look through everything again... Uh, 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 darling, now, darling, don't attract attention, darling. You look through your pockets. No. I'll look in your briefcase. And, and I'll go and see if you dropped it walking in from the plane. Well, I have got it. I know that I have got it. Well, the right, important now, look, thing, now, Mr. Piper, is that we have it. The United States government requires certificate of vaccination for readmission to the country. Next, please. <laughs> We'll return to the couple next door in just a moment. Susie, hand me the phone book, will you please? What are you looking for, Kathy? Uh, banks. Savings banks. Let's see, um, uh, here's one in the yellow pages. Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. Main Street, New Britain. Slater Road, New Britain. Corbin's Corner, West Hartford. Compounds dividends monthly. Pays day of deposit to day of withdrawal interest. Certificates of deposit at 6% for two years and 5 and 3 quarter percent for one year. You want to start a savings bank account, Kathy? Yes, and definitely at Burrett. Why Burrett? Because it's a mutual bank, Susie. It's working for us. You own part of it if you're a depositor, and its profits go to you. Say, can I start an account there with you, Kathy? Gosh, I'd love to have a bank working for me. Well, you know, the, the, uh, the pacing is what impressed me the most, Peg. And Maggie, you were, you were mm -hmm. all of you working together, and the, the dialogue moved so quickly. It's like dancing together, isn't yeah. it, Maggie? Yeah, it really yeah, is. After you've danced with somebody fun. for a long time, you know, and you, and you just know instinctively what they're going to do next. Now, let's talk about Alan Bunce. Yes, so uh, could you tell us, Peg, uh, how you uh, teamed up with Alan? And because, uh, as I say, nobody else could play the part, as far as I can see. Uh, you just had the, the perfect uh, ca well, as typecasting. Well, uh, as a matter of fact, Ed, I was the only one when he auditioned that wanted him. Alan had, uh, uh, Richard Whit Whitmire played it for, uh, I think, about eight months, and then he was going into a play. And he had to start quickly, and we had to audition. I think we auditioned about 50 or 60 people. And Alan was one of them called, but Alan also had had an audition at WR that day. And he was terribly anxious to do that show, and he'd never heard of Ethel and Albert. 
So he rushed over to WR and he made a big thing, and he was late. In fact, we were all through auditioning when he flew in the door, and he didn't know the show, and he hadn't looked at the script, and he read it cold. And he overdid it terribly. But I always felt that uh, they complained about it after the producer and the director, and they said, well, he just, it was too much. He was just overdone. And I said, uh, yes, but you can always tone somebody down. But if there's nothing there, you can't get it out of them. Right. You know, they'll still read it in that flat way. Mm -hmm. Doesn't, don't you think it's right, mm -hmm. Maggie? Mm -hmm. So uh, I really like it. Then he came back. Then he was a little embarrassed after that. He, after he finished it, he said, I, I think I did that a little bit. And I said, well, don't worry about it. And uh, when he went home that night and he told his family that he auditioned for Ethel and Albert, his kids, uh, Lanny, who, uh, Lanny Bunce, who's now uh, his son, who's drama critic for the Christian Science Monitor, but Lanny was then about... Oh, I think 11. Mm -hmm. And Lanny and Elliot, they said, oh, we know the show. We listen every night because it's just like home, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I guess in about, uh, well, I stuck out. I held out for Alan because I thought he was the best. But actually, uh, Alan uh, uh, really took me about, took him about six months to really work into it. And if, if you've got, i got a funny story to tell you about it acting. If, this is very funny about Alan. After, we got a lot of letters complaining about him. They were used to Dick Widmark, you see, and people will do this all right and say, well, we certainly don't like the new Albert. Yes. <laughs> you know, we like the old one. We don't like the new one. And I didn't show these letters to Alan because I knew it would hurt his, hurt his feelings and I didn't want him to be upset. So after about eight months, I had gotten, I think, about, as I recall, well, I'll just pick a number, something like, say, 824 letters, vitriolic letters. I'm really complaining. They didn't like me at all. And I, I answered all of them, as I always did all my fan mail, personally. And I got an answer from every single one. I wrote back and I said, well, just be patient. You will like him. Dick Richard Whitmark's gone into a play and you will like Alan. He's a lovely person. And you will like him. After you can just get used to him. Now, just try it. And, and I heard from every single one of those people <laughs> within the next year, you see. And I saved the letters, put them with the bad letter and said the other one. And Alan and I went down to my apartment, Gramercy Park, between shows one time, to autograph some pictures. We had to send out, and he was so good in there. We'd gotten good notices, and everybody said how wonderful he was. And I thought, this just shows how accurate, <laughs> are, you know. <laughs> you know, you can, can't take uh, one bad letter. You get a thousand no, people say you're wonderful, and one person says, I don't like it at all. And it just sick, destroys you. Can't you. Sleep all right, right, right. And I showed this to Alan, and I couldn't believe it. I said, isn't this marvelous? Look at these people. And they wrote glowing things. They just adored him. They said, we don't even like Richard Widmark. I can't see how we even like him. You're just perfect, <laughs> absolutely perfect. And I was busy autographing, but looked up, I was quiet, and Alan is standing by the fireplace, and he had an arm on the mantel, and his head in his hand. <laughs> he stared. I said, what's the matter? He said, I'm not going to do the show anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no good. I'm terrible. You better fire me. <laughs> Why, he was awful. It took me an hour to convince him that he was wonderful. <laughs> you know, we, we might begin to put Ethel and Albert in some sort of historical uh, perspective here, and I think that uh, it is important to examine the husband and wife teams that evolved over the years in radio. Yes, there were quite a number of them, and uh, maybe we can do one uh, contrasting another one which was very, very popular. Well, if it's the one I'm thinking of, Ed, it has to be Easy Aces. But before we hear the show... I want to remind our listeners that they're listening to the Golden Age of Radio from WTIC in Hartford. Our guests tonight are writer-performer Peg Lynch and actress Margaret Hamilton. And now this word from Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. Kathy, where are you going so fast? To the bank, Richard. I've got to put this money away before I spend it. Where do you bank, Kathy? Where everybody banks, silly, at Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. At what Mutual Savings Bank? Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. I use their convenient Corbin's Corner office in West Hartford, but they also have two offices in New Britain. Well, why the bird, Kathy? It's one bank where I can get 6% for two-year certificates and 5 and 3 quarter percent for one-year certificates. My money really earns there. How about their 90-day accounts, Kathy? Well, they have them, Richard, at 5 and a quarter percent compounded monthly. Why do they have mutual in their name? Because they're owned by their depositors, Richard, and the profits go to them in the form of dividends. Burrett is the only bank around here with Mutual in their name. Well, take care, Kathy. I've got to get back to work. Where do you work, Richard? At Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. What do you do? I take public opinion polls. How wonderful, Richard. Would you ask me some questions sometime? Ladies and gentlemen, easy aces. <laughs> Once again, the strains of Manhattan Serenade introduce Easy Aces, radio's distinctive laugh novelty. Well, 
Well, Jane Ace is determined not to let Paul Barkley get away from Marge. Frankly, she's worried about Marge, already 25 years old and with no other immediate prospect than Paul. But Marge and Paul, it seems, are in no hurry at all. Our scene at the Aces now discovers Marge telling Jane just why there's no hurry. Listen. <laughs> oh, now, Marge, this is no time for brevity. Why don't you be serious? <laughs> Listen, Jane, this is just the time for brevity. And briefly, I'm telling you to stop making plans for my future. Who said anything about your future? All I said was... All you said was you were going to give me a shower. Well, that's for your present, not your future. All the presents that you get, you could... <laughs> oh, oh, all right, you just sit there and laugh. You don't even know what's going on. You just go on laughing. <laughs> That's it. Laugh and show how you ignore yourself. <laughs> you don't know how to handle things like this at all. You're as innocent as a newlywed babe. <laughs> but just wait till Paul finds... Oh, James, stop it. I can't stand this anymore. Well, I can't either. <laughs> Look at me. I'm laughing so hard, I'm crying. See, you're historical. <laughs> you have me believe I'm ancient history. Now, look, Jane, don't rush me. We know what we're doing. Well, what are you doing? Nothing, just waiting. Waiting for what? That's what you did when Jeff was here. You waited and you waited and you're still waiting. Now, Marge, I need to pray into your affairs, but oh, there's... Oh, prayers won't help me, Jane. I guess I'm just hopeless. No, you're not, if you'll only listen to a little advice. Well, what kind of advice? Well, that's better. Now, the thing to do is to marry Paul as soon as you can. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Yes, and the way... What do you mean that's exactly what you're going to do? Well, we're going to get married as soon as we can. And it all depends on how well Paul does with his art. Oh, there you go again. What difference does that make? The difference of about two meals a day. Well, this is no time to think about eating. Love is the thing. You know that the two of you... I know that the two of us have decided to wait. Paul's got to convince me that he can make a go of his art without the aid of that other crowd he used to run around with. You know how that Constance Martell helped him sell his art to the 400. Well, if he can't make a go of it without her, I'm sending him back to her, that's all. You're sending him back? Honestly, Maury, sometimes you exaggerate me so that sending him back to Constance Martell, that's a close paragraph in his life. You know it. Sending him back to her, why? Why, it's abdominal even to think about it. After all you meant to each other and nearly getting shot on a convent, to think that you... Do you think he'd go back? <laughs> oh, it's not a matter of whether he'd want to or not. He'd have to. The difference between success and failure. I couldn't deliberately snatch a man away from a sure success and allow him to be a failure on account of me. Oh, I see what you mean. Well, thank heaven for that. And now, will you please let me... You mean that if he went back to Constance, that he'd make a lot of money selling his paintings. And if he stays with you... If he and I are to continue, he's got to prove first that he can make a go of things on his own. That's what he's trying for now. He's making contacts and trying to get established as a commercial artist. What's that? He's an artist that... Oh, well, it's too long and difficult to explain, Jane, but I know he can do it. He can? Sure he can. He has great talent. You're sure confidential, aren't you? <laughs> well, I try to be confidential, but it doesn't seem to do much good around you, Jane. You know, the, uh, as you were pointing out, Peg, the routines I remembered with Easy Aces were when they were playing bridge together. Oh, excruciating. <laughs> it's, it's really the main thing that I remember, the stupid things that Jane did, and he's so witty. He's a marvelous writer. Well, Peg, um, were you influenced by these earlier shows? Uh, I heard Easy Aces. They were on when I was in, in high school. And I think so. I do. I thought they were marvelous. Oh, yes. And, uh, Have they been on since at all? Mm, I don't know, Ed. They, You're they the did, authority. Uh, they did some commercials uh, well, about six or seven years ago on NBC, uh, just one-minute spots, uh, Jane they? and, uh, and mm -hmm. Goodman Ace. And that's, uh, they were off uh, probably at least uh, 15, 20 years. Uh, yeah. They went off before World War II, I believe. Of course, oh, Goodman yes, Ace sure was one were. of the great writers of mm -hmm. radio and then later on in mm -hmm. television. At the same time, Am Amos and Andy. Everybody yeah, they had the same, same, same time Amos spot, so right. put them in the worst place mm -hmm. to be on the in the. Uh, well, you were more or less influenced by Jane's style, weren't you? Well, I think so, subconsciously. Conscious. I didn't realize that until years later, you know, and I was, uh, and in fact, I, I told someone who knew, I had never met uh, Goodman Ace, but I told someone who knew him well, I said, to, be, to tell him that I thought, <laughs> probably, that's where I got the idea. We'll get back to our guests right after this word from Barrett Mutual Savings Bank. Jim, 
Where can we get those new 6% two-year certificates for our savings? At Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. What Mutual Savings Bank? Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. You know, in New Britain and at Corbin's Corner, West Hartford. Is this a good, safe bank, Jim? There's none better. It has assets of almost $100 million and federal deposit insurance to $20,000. It's a mutual savings bank, the only bank in New England with mutual in its name. Is that good, Jim? It sure is. It means they operate for the people. Their profits go to the people who save there. Well, how about those five and three quarter percent one-year certificates and uh, five and a quarter percent 90-day accounts? Bird has them all. Why don't we start a savings account there, Jim? Well, why not? In fact, why don't we start a joint account? Jim, I thought you'd never ask. It's true, folks. You can have a joint account, a single account, any type of savings bank account at your mutual savings bank in Hartford County. The Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. Save where you see mutual in the name and where safety is the game. At Burrett Mutual Savings Bank, New Britain and West Hartford. Well, Maggie, we still haven't had too much of an opportunity to talk about your career in radio, and, and you appeared on a number of shows. I found out about one called Doctor's Wife. Yes, that was the first one. I had done a spot, you know, in, in um, California, because I was there for 15 years, and out there we did, you know, a lot of shows, and I did sort of guest spots, but I never was on any series until I came back in When 51. was the Doctor's Wife? 51, 52. 51? Mm -hmm. 53, and it went on, uh, we used to call it the uh, grand opera of the soap operas because we had something like two hours rehearsal, which was utterly unnecessary, but we got paid for it, so no one complained much, but we used to sit around, you know, right, you'd yeah. do a half hour show, or no, 15 minutes it was, and you know, for 15 minutes you cannot spend two hours, but we did. And had a lovely time doing it. I guess actually it was an hour and three quarters and then the last 15 minutes, which came from quarter up to six. Uh, we were on the air, and of course a lot of people got, as the expression is, hooked on it because they turned on the radios to get the 6 o'clock news and would hear a doctor's wife and began to sort of be interested in it. And it went on, you know, for mm -hmm. about three and a half years, Manya Starr wrote it, and it was really great fun. I mean, it does, it's the same. Who else was in it? Well, uh, Patricia, Patricia Wheel oh, played yes, the I know uh, that. Mm -hmm. doctor's wife, and the doctor was Donald Curtis, who's now oh, a minister, sure. you know, in California. Really? This was a real minister? From, mm -hmm. Was oh, this coming from States. California, the show? No, no, from here in New York. Oh, from New York. All right. Mm -hmm. You also appeared on a number of major evening broadcasts, including Lux. Yes, and, and uh, the U.S. Steel, when they mm -hmm. did that. Wasn't that in Chicago? I think they did that. Now, on a show like that, Maggie, you, you said that two hours was um, certainly rehearsal. unnecessary mm -hmm. for a 15-minute show as far as rehearsal is concerned. But on a... On a Lux Radio Theater, how much rehearsal would you put in? I, I really can't remember, but I would think it was, um, oh, I would say t maybe two or three days. I really can't remember. It wasn't a week or anything like yeah. that, but yeah. it, maybe it was only two days or, or even, you know, I think on a big show like that it would be one Didn't or two. Didn't you have a studio audience, remember. too? Yes, mm -hmm. always. Mm -hmm. And then we would, uh, the day of the show, as far as I can remember, we were there most of the of the day. Did you have a dress rehearsal with an yes. audience? Mm -hmm. Yes, we had the dress rehearsal with, with, with the audience. I think so, or, although it may not have been. Maybe we had the dress rehearsal and then the audience filed in. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I remember we did have an audience. So it didn't spoil a show for them. <laughs> yeah, so they heard it for the first time. Yes. That was it, and so they would get the laughs. <laughs> well, what did rehearsals consist of with Ethel and Albert Pig? Oh, you mean radio or television? Radio. Oh, radio. We just read through it once and timed it and made cuts. It was just as simple mm -hmm. as that. Mm -hmm. Did you work with many sound effects? Um, we yeah, had oh, some, yeah, sure. you know, yeah. the usual, if you in a car or something. I, I got yeah, over I the years uh, the feeling that it, sound effects are somewhat distracting and they don't always sound exactly. I always, for example, in the soap operas, I always thought people never had any carpets on their floors. <laughs> 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 clatter, 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 <laughs> someone would go, you know, I, well, I'll leave, you know, clatter, clatter, footsteps over and then door slam. Well, you know, at one of the, um, the funniest couples, certainly they couldn't be compared to Ethel and Albert, were the, uh, the Bickersons. Yeah, they, uh, they really, uh, they turned me on, among <laughs> others. Uh, it was the battling Bickersons, and um, quite the antithesis of Ethel and Albert, who got along so beautifully. Uh, these people were always at each other's throats, and uh, in a comic way, of course. And it was with Donna Michi and uh, Francis Langford. And I, I always thought they were really a classic of their kind. Uh, they really were great. Would you like to uh, hear sure, from the Bickersons? Sure, I'd love to. Yes? Yes, I'm terribly sorry. 
sorry. Yes, I'll try. <laughs> yeah. What's the matter? What's the matter, Blanche? The woman in the suite upstairs has called three times. She's asked the manager to have us thrown out. What for? Because she won't stand for your hideous noises. She's revolting. I know, I've seen her. <laughs> Put out the lights. I won't. Not until you promise to stop snoring. Oh, Blanche, can I help it if I snore? Yes, you can. Dr. Hersey says you snore because you've got a long uvula and it flutters against your palate. <laughs> What about the lights? Well, he says he can cure it in his office with a simple operation. Why don't you let him fix it? I'll let him fix it when we get home. You say it, but you won't do it. Do it now. What? Go on, get up and let Dr. Hershey pull out your uvula. Are you out of your mind? In the first place, it's 4 o'clock in the morning. In the second place, we're 3,000 miles from Dr. Hersey. And in the third place, I'm not going to let that medical thief hack on my uvula. He doesn't hack. He snares. I don't care. He knocks it off with a hockey stick. I'm going to lay a hand on my uvula. Stop yelling. You'll wake up everybody in the hotel. I, I don't understand it, Blanche. I swear I don't. What's the matter with you? Why'd you start this? I'm unhappy. Unhappy? Well, here we are in a beautiful hotel... Wonderful jet flight, new luggage. Everything paid for because you won the recipe contest and you're unhappy. Well, I thought it was going to be like the second honeymoon. Ooh. I spent hours in the beauty shop. Got the most expensive negligee and nightgown. And you never even looked at me. I looked at you. <laughs> there you go again. You can't hide it. You're sorry you married me. Oh, bless. Tell the truth, John. Aren't you sorry you married me just a little bit? I'm not sorry just a little bit. You're sorry a whole lot. I'm not sorry at all. Do you love me still? That's the only way I love you. Did you ever find it in your heart to say something nice to me? Nice. Is that asking too much of a husband? Just a tiny compliment? All I ever ask of you is a pleasant smile or a kind word. Wake up, John. What do you want? Maybe something nice to me. I love you. I can't live without you. I think of you every minute of the day. Now shut up and go to sleep. <laughs> can't stand the sound of my voice, can you, John? I can stand it fine. You must really hate me. Blanche, darling, I don't hate you. You love me? You know I do. Well, why don't you say it? I've said it a thousand times. Well, say it now. I love you. Why? Blanche, you're just doing this to try and keep me awake No, I'm not, John, honest, I'm not Why don't you go to sleep, Blanche? You've never changed you're So selfish and inconsiderate Last week was our eighth anniversary And did you bring me a present? No I did, too, I forgot to give it to you I don't believe it What'd you buy? Oh, you won't like it Well, I know I won't <laughs> Hope you didn't spend a lot of money. I didn't have a lot of money. Just a little beach bathrobe. It cost me eight dollars. Eight dollars? That's all I'm worth to you? A dollar a year for cooking your meals, washing your clothes, mending your socks, feeding a baby? We haven't got any baby. Well, what do you want for a dollar a year? <laughs> What's the matter with you, Blanche? You've done something wrong. I can recognize the signs. It's nothing. Want to sit up and talk? Is that it? All right. Tell me how you won the recipe contest. What did you make? <laughs> what is that? Deviled oatmeal. Deviled oatmeal? It has an avocado base with puree, green onions, chicken grits, cereal, and yogurt. I got it from my mother. It looks like your mother. Okay, okay. But I'm surprised you won the contest, considering the fact that you're not the world's greatest cook. But what's wrong with my cooking? Well, it's not bad. It's just odd. Like that rhubarb pie you made. It was two feet long. Well, I couldn't get any shorter rhubarb. <laughs> and you stop picking on my cooking. I'm not picking. Yes, you are. Who went to the trouble of working out that recipe? You did. And despite the fact there were 26,000 other recipes entered, who won the contest? You did. No, I didn't. What? 
Put out the lights, John. Blanche, what, what did you just say? Don't make me suffer like this, please. We spent over a thousand dollars, and and if you didn't... Please tell me, Blanche. Well, first give me a kiss, and then I'll tell you. Tell me first, and I'll kiss you later. Maybe you won't feel like kissing me later. I don't feel like kissing you now. Did you win the contest or not? Well, I would have won it. I just forgot to send them the recipe. Oh. thousand dollars down the drain. And I told my boss to go jump in the lake, too. Well, how could you do this to me? We can't afford a trip like this. Let's get out of here before they arrest us. John! I deny myself to everything. I've been sewing collars on my long underwear and wearing them for shirts. I don't even drink my bourbon anymore. I just chew on the cork and hit myself on the head. Of the John, listen to me. I never spend a penny on myself and she squanders a thousand dollars. You bought a tie pin last week. What tie pin? That was a hypodermic needle. I've been selling my blood. <laughs> now, you just settle down and stop being so hysterical. Maybe I didn't win the contest. But we're not going to have to lay out a thousand dollars. We're not? No, we're not. My Uncle Barney came into a lot of money. And he didn't give us a wedding present, so he's paying the bills for this whole trip. Uncle Barney? Uh, uh, what Uncle Barney? The one who lives in Canada. The one you hate. <laughs> You've read all about it in the newspapers. He was knighted for his operations in the stock market. Knighted? He was indicted. <laughs> and it wasn't the stock market, it was the black market. <laughs> Box. Here's the money. Now, what have you got to say? Nothing. I just don't understand why you torment me like this. Well, you didn't give me a chance to tell you. You and your savage temper. You think I enjoy sitting up all night and beefing like this? Do you ever ask yourself the reason why we argue so much? I can't understand it. Well, just try and think. Why is it an easygoing fellow... A guy who'd run a mile to avoid a fight. Why is it I turn into a demon every night of my life? You got me, John. That's the reason. <laughs> Please take the stand, ma'am. Raise your right hand. Do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Do you have a savings account at Burrett Mutual Savings Bank? I do. Do you have it there for their high dividends, compounded monthly, figured from day of deposit to day of withdrawal? No. In order to take advantage of Burrett's 6% certificates or the popular 5 and 3 quarter percent one-year certificates? No. Well, do you have it at Burrett for their three handy offices, two in New Britain and one in West Hartford? No. You patronize Burrett because of their new modern buildings, their friendly tellers and fast, efficient service? No. Well... Tell the court, ma'am, in your own words, why you consistently do business at Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. Because they are mutual. What you all? Mutual. They work for us. Their profits go to us in dividends and reserves. As depositors, we own them. For me, for you, for the judge, everybody. <coughs> there will be a slight recess in this court while I start my account at Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. The Beckersons were delightful, Peg, yet their situations were contrived, as mm. were Burns and Allen and uh, Fibber McGee and Molly many mm -hmm. times, but yours did not seem to be contrived. They were very natural situations. Well, they weren't when I first started. They, again, were contrived because I was simply patterning after things I'd heard, you know. Mm -hmm. But when I, got, when I came from uh, Cumberland, Maryland, and I started on the network, I, I, and I think it was in Cumberland, I began to realize when people... By accident, I think I would have something on that had happened. I began to put right. things on that had happened to me. And people would come say, well, that's just what happened to us, or something like it happened. And I realized then that the humor lay in the situation. Uh, I'm not a gag writer, which mm -hmm. is what the Bickersons and, and most of the radio programs were in those days. The insult, right. the fight, the feud, and so forth. And uh, so that's really what's what happened. It just became uh, something that uh, people could identify themselves with. When People would write me things, you know, that happened to them, and actually things that, that we did were things that had happened to me, or to Maggie, or to... Uh, I did some things that are uh, based on her son, mm -hmm. Jesuit Boy mm -hmm. in Hamilton, and, uh, and I did things that had happened to Alan. Alan, and one of the things, my favorite, was the time that Ruth and Alan had been uh, uh, going to a very fancy party at uh, 21 years ago, and uh, everybody was there, Elliot Nugent and Jim Serber, and... Uh, people like that, and uh, Robert Montgomery. It was a fancy opening, and as they let us, when they were first married, and as they were leaving the apartment, why, Ruth said, Alan, uh, pick up that uh, 
brown paper bag and so forth. And, uh, okay, he said, not thinking. And they got out, and they got into the 21, and they're sitting here with all the red velvet uh, <laughs> stuff, you know, the Baroque and the lights and all the people in evening dress. And uh, she turned, sat down, uh, well, what have you got there? And he said, what? He said, what's the brown paper sack? She says, I don't know. When we left the apartment, you told me to pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, well, I didn't know such thing. I don't know what you're talking about. And she said, yes, you did. You said, pick it up. So they had it down at the side, you know, and then Ruth looked in the sack, and she said, it's the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> when, hmm? when did uh, Ethel and Albert uh, first go to TV, and were the radio and television shows running simultaneously? Were you doing no, both? No, no. We were on uh, canceled on radio, and... Uh, I went off to Norway with my husband and for the summer, and I thought we were just canceled, and they, ABC wired me and said, would you please come back? We want to do the show again. And I came back, and we did a half-hour radio show with an audience, and they canceled that, and at the very night they canceled, uh, uh, a man named Tom Loeb came up and said, uh, somebody said, Tom Loeb's to see you, and I didn't know who he was, and he... When I went back, uh, backstage, uh, he said, I was just wondering how tied up you were with ABC because uh, we were wondering if you'd be interested in going on NBC with Kate Smith's show, mm -hmm. which is starting television. So for two years, we did the daytime show, television show. We were a 15-minute sketch. Well, not really, 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we, the next year, we started for their own half-hour show for the next uh, six, seven years. And you wrapped mm -hmm. up on radio, I guess, in about 1959? We went back on radio with a couple next door, and that's when Maggie played... Uh, and Effie. Right. She was with us all through our And I, our I guess this was just about the time that, uh, in a sense, CBS threw in the towel as far as uh, network programs were concerned. I guess the you soap mean in operas... 60? Yeah, they came to an end in 60. Well, the ours was an experiment. They, it was the first time they put a, uh, a comedy show mm -hmm. on in the daytime. I can't remember. When were we on? 2.30. Oh, we did, because yeah. that was the nice part. Mm. <laughs> Why don't we listen to the couple next door again? This is... This is uh, well, the same situation. You're you're returning from Europe, and we have Ethel and Albert and Aunt Effie, and here we are. But not in your briefcase. Look, I had, I am telling you, I know, I had my certificate of vaccination on that airplane. Well, no, I, let, oh, you didn't drop it on the way in. I looked everywhere. Well, they were even nice enough to let me back on the plane, and I looked under our seats and everything. Well, there was no yellow card anywhere. Well, uh, what uh, what will you do to him, sir? I, I mean, what happens now if, he, if my husband doesn't have it? Well, uh, depends on where he's been. Now, if he's been in Pakistan, we'll have to have the certificate of yellow fever vaccination. Oh. Pakistan? Yeah, for India, Nepal, and Laos, we'll need cholera. Well, I just haven't been in Pakistan no. or Nepal or India. I, 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 now, I've for been... Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, no. we'll need a typhus <laughs> report. Bulgaria? Look, look, we've been in England, France, and Italy. Well, that's Bulgaria. the smallpox one we need. Well, smallpox, that's, that's, that's yes. what I had, smallpox vaccination. I mean, before we left, I had it in June. But we have to have proof that you had it, Mr. Piper. Now, surely you were informed of that before you ever left the country. Well, yes, of course. I mean, I had it. I had the certificate. I carried it with me all over Europe. I uh, just had it on the plane. I'm when it, we... sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Piper. Saying you had it is not enough. Oh, but not, not there. Not there. Well, 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 well what, what did you do to him? I mean, he isn't going to be arrested. Oh, arrested. Oh, no. No, no, no. No, nothing as serious as that. Wow. No, but we will have to keep him in quarantine for 14 days to see if there's any... Quarantine? Time. 14 days? Or... If there is no outbreak of smallpox in the country you've just arrived from, which we will have to look into, oh. then it is possible we will merely have to revaccinate you. Oh, <laughs> when will I know? Oh, that I can't say, sir. That's up to the chief health inspector. When will and he know? And he'll be busy for some time. Oh. Now, in the meantime, we'll have to hold you in quarantine. So, uh, if you'll just follow me... Well, uh, yeah, I, I guess Aunt Effie, Betsy, and I better go on through mm -hmm. customs, dear. And then we'll go on to the hotel and just wait till we hear from you. Wave goodbye to Daddy, dear. Bye. Uh, it'll be a long time before he scolds you for losing things. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness, weren't you lucky? <laughs> lucky? What are you talking about? Having to stay overnight in quarantine and then get revaccinated? Revaccinated? Even after they found your certificate? They didn't find it. What are you talking about? I, I still oh, don't know what yes. the heck happened. Yes, the airline found it. What? Know where you put it? 
It was in that pocket on the back of the seat in front of you. You know. Apparently, you got it mixed up with all the literature on the airline. You know, the maps and the schedule and the pamphlet on what to do in case of emergency, how to put on your life jacket and all that, you know. Oh, oh no, no, no. Yes. Uh -huh. well, they told me just now when I went in to ask about my sunglasses. Uh -huh. They said to tell you they were turning the certificate into the customs since they didn't know where to find you. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's just yeah. great now that I don't need it. Oh, God. Come on. Come on. see how it happened. Yeah, sure. Let's Let's go now, let's go. Where are we going? Where are we going? Oh, oh, oh wonderful. Going? I can't wait to tell everybody about my trip. <laughs> oh, neither can I. Oh, did the airline have your sunglasses? Oh, oh no. Oh. It felt so silly. Well, I got Woody over there, and then I discovered I had them in my purse all the time. Oh, oh, oh no. Boy, oh, 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 it's a dumb family. Too. Come on, let's oh. go home. <laughs> understand it. I told everyone when we were coming home and not a single person has called us. I've called Elmer. She doesn't answer. Myra's not home. Hmm. Neither is Anne Mundell. Well, I'll try Mrs. Houston. Yes, yes. I opened all the windows upstairs to why the place is so stuffy. Hey, for Pete's sake, didn't you cancel the newspaper? Well, oh, I just got a, got a three and a half month pile of newspapers. That newsboy pan is heaved in there every day. <laughs> Why well, didn't cancel them? No, you said you were. I, oh, oh Why would the newsboy? Hello? Oh. Is Mrs. Houston there? Oh, I tell you, if there's anything more discouraging than three months of back newspapers. Oh. I see. Oh, uh -huh. Is this Myrtle? Well, uh, yes, if you, if you would. Uh, uh, Mrs. Piper. And tell Mrs. Houston that we're back home. Well, yes, we've been gone over three months. <laughs> to Europe. Thank you, Myrtle. Well, at least Mrs. Houston's maid was home, and she was nice enough to ask where we'd been. Well, she didn't know we'd been gone. Well, I don't know who did it, but one of us left some cream corn in the refrigerator, oh. and there's at least two inches of mold on the top. Oh. Other than that, we have no food in the house at all. Oh, dear, I'll call the store and order some groceries. Yeah. At least I'll hear a familiar voice, and Mr. Holland might ask if we had a good time. Yeah, well, look, I'm going down and check the basement. Huh? All right, dear. Oh, dear. There comes Betsy back down the driveway. I suppose oh. Susie Elvin was off playing with somebody else. Betsy looks so let down. Oh, dear. Well, I know just how she feels. Mm -hmm. Look at her. Oh, at last. Get it, Betsy. Get it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Who is it? Yes. Yes, this is the Piper. Is it for me? Is it Alan? It's the dry cleaners. Pick up oh. day tomorrow. You have anything to go? Oh, dry cleaners. Mm -hmm. Oh. Wait a minute, that's Mrs. Hmm? Bolden. I know I said oh, her from Italy. Let me have... Hello? Oh. Yes? Oh, oh no. wonderful, Mrs. Bolden. Oh, Bolton. the plumber. Yes. Oh, the plumber. Uh -huh. For the love of I get off the phone. Get uh -huh. off the phone. The Please. basement is flooded. Yes, what? what? Get off what the phone. It? Some pipe is broken or something. I don't know. The oh. basement's flooded with water. It's apparently rising. You can give me the phone. Well, you give me the go, phone. will you? Let ah. it rise. I'm going to tell somebody about my trip if I have to tread water while I'm doing it. Oh, Hello, Mrs. Bowden. Look, hurry up and call the I plumber. Can't, I can't talk, but we had a wonderful trip. Yes. Everything we have needs dry cleaning, so tell the man to stop, hurry won't up. you? Will you, will you hurry up? Oh, my goodness, this is some homecoming. The Couple Next Door stars Peg Lynch and Alan Bunce. It's fun listening to it again. Maggie, you, you really enjoyed hearing <laughs> I know, it again, I did. Well, I always did. I just loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I loved to hear it and loved to be, do uh, it. And the humor, of course, is just as fresh today as it was when it was recorded. We were talking this afternoon at lunch, and one of the cute things we had was Maggie was so funny on one of the episodes we had. We were in London, and Aunt Effie... Uh, played by Maggie, had uh, sewn her money in her girdle, <laughs> and she'd forgotten about it, and she washed it, you see. <laughs> and so we had unstitched the girdle, and we were hanging up all this money in the hotel room in London, and the maid walked in, and here's all this, all these dollars, you see. And I said, uh, Ethel said, it's terrible. It's no wonder all the Europeans think we're millionaires, you know. We're <laughs> <laughs> stringing up money as soon as we get there. Drawing it out. Drawing it out. <laughs> We'll continue our conversation in just a moment. First of all, I want to remind our listeners 
There is something solid and true about things that have survived the years. Music, drama, art, as personified by tonight's presentation, are manifestations of this. Another is a tried and true institution such as the Burrett Mutual Savings Bank, which since 1889 has existed through good times and bad, war and peace, yet continues to grow and prosper with the years. Safety, service, and growth have been the hallmarks of Burrett's progress, all built on the premise of good customer service. You can save at Burrett with confidence, with pride. Why not start your account today? Offices at Corbin's Corner, West Hartford, 267 Main Street, New Britain, Slater Road, New Britain. Deposits insured to $20,000 by Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Do you, do you miss radio as a creative endeavor today, Peg? Oh, yes. Maggie? Oh, sure. oh, yes, I just loved it. I really did. Does television hold the same feeling for either one of you? No, I, 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 it's entirely different, really. The, the excitement, I think, is, is, is creating it just with your voice. It's really wonderful. Yes, it was. It, it was a great era. Well, I guess we could go on all night, but unfortunately, time won't let us. I do want to thank both of you, Peg Lynch and Margaret Hamilton, for sharing this hour of radio's golden age with us tonight. Well, thank, thank you for bringing back all these memories. It's a lot of fun. This is Dick Bertell speaking for co-host Ed Corcoran, the man with 2,000 hours of recorded old-time radio memories. On August 27th, five weeks from tonight, our guest will be the great radio actress of the soap operas, Jan Minor. The Golden Age of Radio was edited by Dave Kaplan and produced by Brian Hartnett. The program has been brought to you by Burrett Mutual Savings Bank with offices at Corbin's Corner, West Hartford, 267 Main Street, New Britain, and Slater Road, New Britain. Burrett, offering you the best in safe banking and good customer service since 1889. Touch that dial. Listen to. Kraft Foods Company presents Willard Waterman as the Great Gildersleeve. Mexico service stations and dealers in all our 48 states present for your entertainment Eddie Duchin and his music. Graham McNamee. And Edwin, the fire chief.